Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. We are here in our Monitor Steve discussion format to talk about Intel's new 11th gen processors. So hopefully by now you would have seen our two reviews we've got on the channel so far of the 11600K and the 11900K. And we're probably not gonna cover the 11700K, but as well, you might have seen reviews from other people over the past couple of weeks about that CPU as well. And let's be honest, there's a lot of stuff to talk about with this launch, a lot of concerns, a lot of issues, and yeah, a lot of interesting things. So Monitor Steve, here you are, how are you going? Good, thanks, and it's good to be in the studio today, not my shed, so the builders aren't here today, so I can set nice. everything up in here and have the conversation from the regular setting. Uh, so that's good to do anyway. But I guess before we get into sort of the new topics that we've got and the things we want to discuss, we could actually reflect and recap a bit on looking back at the review of the review, because that's where we sort of got involved yes, with this right. whole yep. 11th gen. Uh, it's quite interesting looking back. I mean, obviously, I haven't watched the whole hour of all our thoughts and comments on uh, Ian and Anantec's review. But even watching the follow or the, or the follow up, the fallout of, of his review is quite interesting as well. Obviously, a lot of people were skeptical as to how accurate his findings were, expecting yep. BIOS updates. Because let's be honest, it is a bit hard to believe that they could go backwards in so many areas with what's meant to be a new improved architecture. They were touting 20% IPC gains. So we were expecting pretty good things. I mean, we know it's a backported architecture, but we were still expecting more than what we got. I mean, in a lot of ways, you said you weren't terribly surprised by the end result, but still... You can understand why a lot of people found it hard to believe that in some instances gaming performance was 5-10% down on the part it's meant to be replacing, which is the 10900K. In the, in the case of the 11900K, the 11700K is a little bit different. So it is interesting looking back at, there was obviously a lot of people that were upset with his review, saying yep. that it was misleading, and it was going to be inaccurate, and performance was going to be much better than that, and all that sort of stuff. And while you could argue that performance may have improved a little bit like we were suggesting it may with updated BIOS as you get a couple of percent here, a couple of percent there. But overall, well, I think overall it may have only changed the the picture by, yeah, a couple of percent. So his review was very accurate and having seen reviews from, you know, all the usual suspects, you know, Tech Power Up, ourselves, Gamers Nexus, and Antex obviously done a follow-up review. And we're all sort of saying the same things for the most part. I think most reviewers are as well. Like I looked at, I don't know how many YouTube reviews and yeah, a lot of people were dumping on the uh, 11900K, rightfully so. Uh, obviously there's no 11700K reviews because Intel didn't sample that. They just allowed you to buy <laughs> it early. And then the 11600K, which, you know, it's not a terrible part, but it's also not a particularly compelling part. I think it is worse than the 5600X and the discounted 10600K, which I think that discount that a lot of US retailers were showing ends today. So I think that will go back up towards the normal price. But even there, it's like, is the 11600K really worth a premium over the 10600K? Especially if you're a gamer. I would, yeah. I would have thought no. I think, so, it, I think this whole thing has been a really good lesson of how IPC gains that we see you know, companies always talk about this, mm -hmm. especially the metric that you mentioned. I think Intel touted 19% for the Ice Lake architecture over Skylake, but they always measure this in productivity applications. And <laughs> what we've seen many times now is that IPC gains for productivity doesn't translate necessarily to gaming performance improvements. So for a part that was really positioned as meant to bring back Intel to the leadership position in gaming, when the benchmarks were more focused on 19% improvements in productivity. Again, there's no there's no crossover there in a lot of situations. And a lot of the time it really comes down to how's the memory controller performing? Mm -hmm. What are the latencies in between cores and to the memory? Those things have a much more important role in gaming performance. So mm -hmm. I think this hopefully will mean that when we see these claims in the future about IPC, that we take a closer look at what they're actually talking about. And if there's no accompanying improvements for those areas, then we're not likely to see gaming performance improvements again, which might be an important lesson for Alder Lake, where they're talking about 20 to 30% single thread performance improvements again, which is going to be decent for productivity if that turns out to be true, but again, may not translate to a significant improvement into gaming. Mm, exactly. I have to admit, I don't remember the exact slide. You may remember it because you actually covered it, I think, in one of the news corners. 
they were really focused on that reclaiming the performance crown or solidifying their dominance yep. as the, the the fastest gaming CPU. And do I, I don't know if I'm recalling correctly, but I think that was saying it was like a 5% improvement, though I don't know if they were comparing that to their previous gen part or their competitions. Not sure it on did, that one. It did vary a bit. I think the, okay. the thing that caught my... Well, it, maybe I shouldn't say it was surprising given how Intel has demonstrated their performance gains in the past, but it was based on a very limited selection of games. I think at mm. most we... In the more recent data, we got like four games, and I think previously they might have shown six, maybe. Mm -hmm. And they did compare it to like 10900K and and AMD's 5900X, I believe, or maybe 5950X. Mm -hmm. And again, the performance delta there was like 13%, maybe in like your best case scenario, but single digit gains shown in a couple of the other titles. So I think that's mostly what they were showing. Yeah, and I guess no surprises there. That's just typical marketing practices. They yep. often like to mislead with their benchmarks. I could certainly grab 30 games, compare the 1100K with the 1100K and the 5800X or 5900X doesn't really matter. And I'm sure I could pick, I could find half a dozen games where the margins are favorable for Intel. So you could definitely peri, uh, cherry pick those results. But yeah, if you want to use a broader range of games or just the typical sort of uh, battery of benchmarks, then yeah, it's not going to come out particularly well. So anyway, we have recapping on the last sort of review of the review, things didn't change too much. And if anything, the overpriced, because at the time we didn't know what the prices were going to be. I yeah, speculated exactly. that, I remember you were sitting there grinning at me, just shaking your head when I speculated that surely, surely this can't be priced at 10900K pricing for the, for the 11900K or above. And you were just like, well, they're definitely going to. And yeah. I'm like, I I'm aware of that, but surely not. Because, again, this whole, I don't know, what would you call it, the the, the 11th gen launch disaster, it, it's really about pricing. Yeah, they are power hungry and they don't, yeah, temperature's not so much of an issue, I suppose, because you're probably going to put a decent cooler on them. But they are power hungry. Um, but if the price was right, then it wouldn't be such an issue. And, again, that's why our 11 600K reviewers certainly more favorable than the 11900k review so yeah, pricing was the main yeah. issue there i think previously when intel has done stuff where they become into a more favorable pricing position like what we saw a little bit with the like the high-end desktop parts the hedt stuff competing with i think it was second gen threadripper or threadripper mm -hmm. 3000 at the time intel mm -hmm. lowered pricing on a lot of those parts but often what would happen is they would you know, call a, a higher core count part a lower name so that performance to performance you'd be getting, you know, more cores or higher frequencies, which, again, we sort of saw that in the past with, like, the 10th gen, for example. You went from having eight cores at your $500 price point to having 10 cores. So you do get yep. more performance at the same price. But with this generation, mm. they couldn't do that. They couldn't shift the whole stack down and make, like, an eight core in a Core i5 line to compete with, a six core on AMD side, they were capped at eight cores. So mm -hmm. you had this weird situation where you have to make both the Core i7 and the Core i9 eight cores um, because they can't go any higher. They can't adjust pricing in any other way. And again, we've seen from Intel that it's not very typical that they just cut pricing. Like they don't very often mm -hmm. say, oh, well, the Core i9, the previous gen was $500. Now it's $400. Our best hope was really getting like Core i9 performance from the previous gen in Core i7 tier this generation. And unfortunately for Intel, it's kind of gone the other way, especially the Core i9 bracket where, yeah, we're getting worse performance in that tier. And then on top of that, the thing that we weren't able to predict was, you know, we, we would have seen 10900K pricing around $500. I don't think either of us would have expected the actual price to be over $600 for that part, which just makes it insanely bad value. Yeah, I have seen it listed, oh, I can't remember where now, somewhere in the US for 550 US, but there was no stock. But if I had to guess, I would say it's going to probably cost around 570. I think that's probably a, possibly a conservative estimate, but it's going to cost at least 570, I would say, when you can purchase it. So that's a hell of a premium, really, especially when, what is it, the, I've got a couple of notes here, the 10900K is currently on sale for $460. Yep. So that is a massive discount. And you got um, the 10850K as well, which we haven't talked a lot about, but on top of that, that's also available as sort of your yes. slightly lower clocked version of a 10900K. I guess while we're talking about other parts, we could talk about, I've seen a lot of questions 
for people asking why reviewers have ignored the 10, oh, sorry, the 11 400F. So yep. we see this a bit. People get a bit confused, a bit, well, they're either concerned or frustrated that those reviews aren't there on day one. And really the reason for that being is that Intel doesn't sample the locked parts ever. I'm not sure if they ever have. I don't want to say ever because ever is a long time, but uh, <laughs> typically recently. typically you get like the flagship, you know, Core i7 or Core i9, and then, you know, usually like a flagship Core i5 as well. So in this case, we've got the Core i9 and the Core i5. They skip the Core i7 because it's, that would make the Core i9 look dumb. So I guess that was a somewhat wise they did sort with of choice on their behalf. Well. I believe they sent yeah. the 10600K and 10900K for 10th gen, so similar. Yeah. So really, if you look at the whole generation on paper, the 11 400F looks pretty decent. Uh, it's, I think it's listed over at Newegg for $175 US. So that's the 10 400F is $150 US, so 17% cheaper. But it's a reasonable price for, you know, you, get, you are getting that IPC uplift for productivity workloads. Gaming performance should be in the ballpark, pretty similar, uh, with a B560 motherboard. God, yep. the name's being so B560, close to AMD. Yep. Um, you do get the, the memory overclocking on those boards. You can't use it on a B460. Maybe that's something we'll talk about later. But it, it does look like being a, a really good value part, especially with the Ryzen 5 3600. What's that back at? Did I even... That's at 220 US. Um, so that's going to be more expensive than the 11400F. So really, the 11400F is going to be the go-to CPU, I would say, for, for most gamers and you know, mid-range buyers. And it would have been some positive coverage for Intel. But instead, we're looking at the 11600K, which is only pretty average, and then the 11900K, which as Gamers Next has put it, is an embarrassment or, yeah, worse. <laughs> so, 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 I don't know, do you think that is an oversight on Intel's behalf, not not supplying reviewers with what is actually their best offering in terms of value and a part that I imagine most of our viewers would be most interested in? Mm. I think, well, from a perspective, for, for our perspective, it would make a lot mm. more sense to do that because... Yep. Obviously, a lot of the narrative around the 11th gen launch has been how bad it is, especially mm -hmm. for something like the 11900K. And I guess the 10600K has gotten lukewarm reception to bordering on positive. But certainly if they had sampled an 11400F, they could have changed the whole discussion around 10th gen, uh, 11th gen. I don't think people would have been as focused on how bad the 11900K was when they could mm -hmm. talk about the value op opportunity that an 11400F provides up against the Ryzen parts, which is still very expensive. So mm -hmm. from that perspective, I guess that was very much a missed opportunity and potentially would have swayed a lot more of the enthusiast DIY buyers into potentially buying an Intel part for their next build. But on the other hand, Intel clearly doesn't want to do this, not because they're worried about the negative press of their parts, but because they want people to buy high-end CPUs. And for mm -hmm. the most part, I think what they're really gunning for is like the mainstream audience. So not people that watch Gamers Nexus or Hardware on Box, but there's a lot of other review sites that, let's say, don't go as in-depth into the qualities of these processes, so your more mainstream audience sites. And I think they want people to feel like the 11900K is an upgrade. They want the 11600K to be the the budget buy. So forget the mm -hmm. 11400F. They want the 11600K to be the product that people want to buy for your mid-range build, which is obviously a lot more expensive than the locked part. So I think they're trying to capture some of that audience and sort of say, oh, yeah, we're, well, this is the Core i9 part. This is the part you want. It's better than the previous parts. And we'll forget that people are going to trash it big time. So, yeah, I think it would have been maybe embarrassing for them or against their sort of the marketing that they've used in the past for them to focus on a really cheap product because they've always positioned themselves as the premium brand that offers the best performance. So if they're suddenly mm -hmm. switching to, well, actually you should buy this $170 CPU, not our $500 CPU, I don't think that's something that the executives would have been all that happy about. Yeah, so I totally agree with that. I reckon you've hit the nail on the head. It's a sort of safe face thing. They want to remain as the premium brand, which we'll talk more about that later because it answers a few other questions that we've <laughs> seen. Um, but yeah, basically, 
we didn't get samples. That That's it. So we're not avoiding what is their better value part or whatever it may be. We just didn't get a sample. We couldn't buy one yet. Uh, the day of release, I ordered one. Uh, it should be arriving with me today, actually. So we'll get a review out on that probably sometime next week. So that's it. Thanks to our Patreon and Floatplane <laughs> members, we're able to buy these parts. And yeah, Intel's not interested in sampling them after the fact or any time down the track. They just refuse to do it. Uh, their policy is they don't sample Core i3s and locked parts. So what reviewers get is what they get, which I, I think... Yeah, I think it's a miscalculation on their end, to be honest with you, because we do guides, you know, build guides, top five CPU, a lot of recommendation things. And a lot of reviewers aren't in the position that we are, where we can just go buy CPUs that we don't, you know, we're going to have to buy their core i3s, the core i5s we don't get. Maybe you guys will want us to look at some locked i7s. And they're quite expensive here in Australia. So buying all those parts is something that, you know, a lot of reviewers can't do. So Intel will miss out on that positive coverage. But anyway, that's that's the situation there. So hopefully that addresses that one for you guys, because I've seen that quite a bit in the comment section on Twitter and the various social medias. And another question I've seen a bit of is, why don't we focus on overclocking for the mm. k skew units? Um, I've seen this quite a bit. So a few people have suggested that we do that because we're AMD biased and we don't want to show how well Intel CPUs perform when fully unleashed, which obviously isn't the situation. Uh, with a review like the 11900K, if the 11900K had been a, a compelling part, like quite good value, quite interesting, we would have certainly delved more into it. Obviously, I cut the productivity benchmark short by like half because it's like, yeah, it's slower than the 10900K, move on. And then we looked, I focused more on the gaming because I knew that's what our audience would be interested in. But overclocking like if look if you could have unleashed another 20 percent performance or something like that front we would have certainly included overclocking but you're eking out a couple of extra percent for you know risking stability and a huge increase in power consumption so in that particular instance overclocking just it's not useful it's not interesting it's not worth investing the time in and in general we don't focus too heavily on overclocking and show that in a lot of the graphs because it's silicon dependent like we could get a chip that's just amazing. And there was all that controversy a few years ago about reviewers getting cherry picked CPUs, which again, we thought sort of that was a bit blown out of proportion because 90 something percent of our benchmarks don't include OC results anyway. And it's certainly not a focus of our content because it's silicon dependent. You could get a really bad 11900K that only just runs stock, or you could get one that, you know, overclocks better than most. So it's not really representative what you may end up with. So for us, it can be a bit misleading. Uh, and also, it's just the overclocking arm race thing. Like, you, so you overclock the 1100K, so then you're going to overclock the equivalent AMD processor, and then how are you going to overclock that? And is it a good representation of how, say, a 5900X overclocks, or if you've got a crappy CPU? Because you've got a sample size of one. And then how are you overclocking it? Because, you know, AMD does like memory tuning, so you're going to tune up the memory. And there's a whole, as I said, it's an arms race. There's heaps of different ways of going about it. At the end of the day, they both don't overclock particularly well. Uh, but yeah, you can use high frequency memory, tune the memory timings, and when you're very CPU limited, get 10, 15% more performance. But that applies to both sides. So I guess overclocking could be separate content. But again, you're still limited to a sample size of one. So that's why it's not a focus for us. We just don't think it's a good thing to focus on. Yeah. What do you reckon, Tim? Well, and on top of that, we've polled our audience in the past about things like how many people overclock their CPU. Mm -hmm. And the numbers, I believe, were sort of around 10% of people were overclocking mm -hmm. or at least mm -hmm. running an overclock as, as a daily option. Surprisingly low. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it is, it is a, a low percentage. And I think that's indicative of how, over time, overclocking has given people less and less like mm -hmm. you're not able to get 20 percent 30 percent out of these parts like you were able to 10 years ago um, because that's just free performance like if a significant percentage of cpus can give you an extra 20 percent of performance then that should be given to you stock which is i think a lesson that amd has learned that they try and run their processes as close to the edge as they possibly can while being stable and we're seeing intel move in that direction as well over time so yeah i think Overclocking is still interesting in some areas, especially once you get down to a lot of the fine tuning stuff. People have fun doing like 
per core overclocking? You know, do we find like the golden chiplet for, you know, like a 5950X overclock one of the chiplets, don't overclock the other one. So yeah, it just becomes very complicated. And for the gains that you're getting, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to focus significantly on it. And I think and I think the reaction from most reviews that I saw was that a part like the 11900K is a poor overclocking chip. So mm -hmm. it doesn't make, a, a, it doesn't change the conclusion of that part whatsoever whether it could overclock by an extra 5% or not. It's it's a terrible value product regardless of the overclocking situation. I think one of the things I really wanted to talk about in this um, this little discussion piece that we're doing, the things that I always really enjoy, um, is why is why does the 11th gen exist? Mm. I, I think this is something that's come up, especially looking at the 11900K, and it may not apply as much when you do get to test an 11400F, for example, but mm -hmm. this whole launch is just, I mean, apart from the fact they've botched many areas of the launch, like, you know, the 11900K being only slightly faster than the 11700K. But the main conclusion I come out from, in general, reading all these reviews, is that these parts just don't need to exist. They could mm -hmm. have continued to offer the 10th generation. There's, there's nothing wrong with it. it. It's quite competitive in gaming. It's certainly not quite at the level of a 5800X or 5900X, but at the same time, the the 11th gen parts are in a very similar position. And then on top of that, you still have like a 10900K, which offers more productivity performance than Intel's current best 11th gen part. Mm. So they've spent all this time producing this line, backporting Ice Lake to 14 nanometer, which is probably not something that Intel was originally planning or hoping to do. So it's sort of like a, a last ditch effort to eke one more generation out of 14 nanometer. But they spent all this effort and time. They've released these new CPUs. They probably cost more to make because they're larger dies. They've, th there's obviously the engineering cost of the processors, all for a line that is no better. Like, why, why did they do this? Yeah, well, that, that is certainly the question that a lot of people have been asking. And we if you recall, started asking that back when we reviewed Ian's review. We were sort of thinking, well, we believe this is accurate performance. And if it is, why? Like, why are they releasing this? Yep. And I think at the time, the, the best thing I could come up with is that they're hoping that it will reboot CPU sales. So, you know, they can put the new 11th gen sticker on there. It's got some nice new box art that's very different to the not that that's the box, but that's the artwork. Um, it's different to the previous generation, so it looks flashy and new and updated, and they can claim 20% IPC improvement, which is a somewhat genuine claim, depending on what you're doing. So I, I think it was just to drive sales. And if we look at where, for these sort of CPUs, you know, the, the desktop CPUs and the mobile CPUs, where Intel really makes its money, it's not through guys like you know, well, our audience, for example, it's not really do-it-yourself PC builders. It's from pre-built systems like OEM systems from the likes of Dell, HP, and so on. And I think, again, I don't really go in those circles much, but I imagine being able to put a new sticker on it and saying this is the new HP whatever, and it you know has a 20% IPC improvement over the 10th gen. I think that's why they've done it, because that helps drive sales, obviously. People want the latest and greatest, and... You know, I, just doing a refresh or yep. doing a price cut doesn't really achieve that. And also doing a price cut, even if that does drive sales, you're making less money per sale. Yeah, I think the OEM thing is, is a really key point because it's not just about HP being able to advertise 20% IPC because I don't think that they would advertise that necessarily. It's more about a lot of these OEMs have a yearly release cadence. So, mm -hmm. you know, it comes to like back to school, for example, for laptops or end of the year for sort of your holiday sales, they come out with a new desktop PC and they just use whatever is available on the market at the time. So that would be, you know, that upgrade to the newest graphics. They'd probably update like the case design so it's a little bit cooler, a little bit more modern. You know, they'd increase the amount of memory and storage and all those sorts of things. So they want to be able to say, well, our 2021 desktop pre-built is better than the last version because we've gone from 10th gen to 11th gen. So mm. I think ultimately for that market, it doesn't really matter what the chip is actually offering. It's all about just saying, well, our 2020 model had 10th gen, our 2021 model has 11th gen, 
that's the situation. You're buying a new processor, it's increased the number by one because it's mm-hmm. for a market that isn't doing the level of research and you know, looking at benchmarks that you know people in the enthusiast market buy. So it is possible that they've basically, I don't know what the word you'd call, like conceded the DIY market and just said, well, we have to release these chips, so th- they're released, all for the OEM market. Um, because the, it really otherwise doesn't make a lot of sense. And as you say, you can't just price cut a 10900K and sell it in pre-built still. That is, they're still going to price their pre-built at the same amount of money as the, mm-hmm. pu- the previous generation model. So yeah, I think that's a really, really good point and probably shows what's happening here. Unfortunately, though, what may spill over is that the reception for a part like the 11900K has been so negative that eventually you get the spillover into the more mainstream market, which has worked in the opposite direction for AMD. You know, AMD started to make headway in the mainstream market, in the DIY market, which then influenced people mm-hmm. buying pre-builds, you know, especially from your more boutique builders and not necessarily Dell and HP, but more like your Origin PC and those type of companies. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't, that- yeah, I think that is potentially an issue for them, but... Yeah, we'll see how that plays out, I guess. Yeah, that's right. And as you say, AMD is slowly making inroads there. It is a slow process. And the yeah, in- Intel can't really afford this right now. I-, I think that will have a knock-on effect unless they can really turn it around with future generations. If they continue to struggle over the next few generations, what's happening now will hurt them down the track. Because speaking with you know, the boutique builders and the-, the small pre-built system builders, it's really interesting speaking to them because... Basically, they say if you're doing a pre-built, especially a high-end one, and you can put like the Core i7, Core i9 sticker on there, it will out- outsell anything AMD. And that's true of the existence of Zen 3, for example. But then if they're selling just the CPUs, so the CPUs to probably people who are in our audience, AMD is just obliterating Intel in actual CPU sales. So it's quite interesting that if you're selling just the part and you're selling it to someone who's obviously done their research and is building their own computer... They know which they know that AMD is offering more performance or better value or better efficiency or whatever it is. They're just offering the better product. But then people who aren't as confident or haven't done the research or don't want to build their own computer or whatever are still sticking with that mentality that Intel is best. Yeah, and so, it may not it may not even be the mentality that Intel is best, but Intel is familiar. Like mm, their, exactly. their previous yep. pre-built might have been like a you know, a Haswell Core i5 or Core i7 build. Mm-hmm. So you go, oh, okay, well, I had my Intel process. I was happy with it. I'll buy the next version of that same line, which is how a lot of buying works. Like, that's a very, that's very right. common thing. But I think I think something that we'll see, and it's, I was, we were talking about this a little bit recently in the Moore's Law is Dead podcast that we did over on his channel, um, mm-hmm. like a two-and-a-half-hour discussion. And one of the things that I've started to notice is as we start to see Apple Silicon come into Mac products, which you might think is not in any way related to desktop processors at all, which is probably fair. Um, As we start to see Apple Silicon come in, there's more and more of a shift against Intel amongst mainstream, the mainstream buyer, where people are Mm -hmm. more and more realizing that Intel has been stagnating in this market because Apple is able to come out of nowhere and produce a laptop chip that is very, very competitive with, well, beats Intel's parts in most situations. So people are sort of, uh, the the gears are ticking over slowly in those buyers that, well, Intel isn't giving the performance that we need anymore because Apple's able to come in and just shake up the market a bit. And I think slowly that is going to impact the desktop market for OEM buyers. And obviously we're already seeing, we've already seen this in the, main, in the DIY market quite a bit. So as you say, CPU sales are being dominated by AMD. So you're kind of getting it squeezed from both ends at the moment. The, the DIY builders are encouraging people to buy Ryzen. And then a lot of the talk from the mainstream market is about how Intel is stagnating, which I think it may not impact them this generation, but if they can't get the act together quickly in terms of CPU performance, then this the, the narrative around Intel is going to shift against them from all angles. So mm-hmm. maybe they can ride this one out in that market, but I don't think there's as much, I don't know, goodwill left than there might have been around, say, the KB Lake launch, which was another less than favorable launch from Intel recently. Yeah, so I agree with all of that. So that's pretty much why they why they had to do it, or at least why we think they had to do it. Uh, so I guess that answers the next question I was going to ask, which is, you know, what should they have done instead? So I suppose 
to rephrase that, in hindsight, so seeing how this has all played out, uh, maybe it's too early to call that, would they have gone about it differently? Obviously, you know, all the negative press they've got and does that affect, you know, hurt their image and will that have a knock-on effect for generations down the track or not? And I guess it's far too early to call all of that. But I guess just in our own opinion, Tim, what do you think they should have done instead is, is where I'm working <laughs> towards? Oh, it's, it's a hard question. Um, I think there's, there's probably almost two ways they could have gone about it. I think we've talked a lot about how they could have just not released anything and just kept mm-hmm. the 10th gen in the market, keep the prices at their discounted rate and sort of just wait for the next generation, which that may have led to a two-year gap without any processes, but I think 10th gen is still competitive enough with Zen 3 for the time being mm-hmm. and with Zen 4 not really like just about to launch. It's, it seems like it's still a fair way away. Um, maybe end of the year, for example, they they probably could have ridden it out with just tenth gen. I I guess if they were going to release, say, an eleventh gen product, then again, there's probably two ways they could have gone. I think the the number one thing that they shouldn't have done is release a Core i9 processor. If they don't have a Core i9 that makes any sense, they should have just not released it, and mm-hmm. just stuck with the Core i7 and maybe just kept the the previous gen Core i9 as sort of that's the offering for people that want a Core i9. Alternatively, they could have you know if they instead of you know, backporting and doing all this 14, 10 nanometer to 14 nanometer stuff, they could have just refreshed Coffee Lake or yeah, what was it, so. Comet Lake on yep, Comet Lake. and make it 11th gen, like increase the frequency slightly or change something up slightly there to make it a bit more impressive and called it a day. I mean, let's be honest, that's what they used to do. <laughs> so, yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, why can't they go back to doing that? But I, I think that would have been the way to go because... As you say with the OEMs, they're not advertising a 20% IPC improvement because people don't know what that means. They can genuinely claim improved performance, which is probably something they do in their advertisements, like buy the new 11th gen because it's faster. But yeah, I, I think they could have also made that claim by bumping up frequencies or something by 100 megahertz mm. would have achieved the same thing and then apply some discounts across the board. I mean, Intel obviously doesn't like to do that. But even if they had kept prices the same, I imagine the margins would have been as good or better. So, And, and one thing they could have done one. as well, that I think we were talking a little bit about this earlier, was push the stack down. Like, for example, make make the keep, say, like a 10900K as a Core i9, make it the 11900K, but then you could make a Core i7 like where the 10850K is today. So mm-hmm. you'd make that, you'd make your, your Core i7 part 10 cores, make your Core i5 8 cores, and at the same prices, that would have been very, very competitive with, with Zen 3. Yeah, that's true. It's essentially what they've done, but the other way around, <laughs> kind of. So, yeah, yeah, that would have made way more sense. So I think that would have been the way to go about this and just, yeah, put Rocket Lake, just scrap it as a failed experiment or, I don't know. That, but again, it'll all the success of this will be determined, I suppose, by what those OEM sales look like, um, all those pre-built system sales. So... You know, not that that's our really our area of interest and we'll follow up on that, but that would probably determine whether this will be a success for them or not. Do you think Intel misread the market a little bit in the development stages of a processor like Rocket Lake? Because I, I think we can probably forgive Intel for not realizing that there'd be a global shortage of PC components at this time. Like at mm-hmm. the time they were developing Rocket Lake, this probably wasn't on the horizon. But a lot of this launch really feels like Intel was trying to compete with products that exist in the market. Like, for example, a Ryzen 5 5600 or a 5900X that was in stock or even just a 5600X that was in stock. Whereas it really feels like the line up that they've produced is kind of, yeah, it's meant for that instead of meant for a market where you can only really buy a 5800X. Like, it would have just made a lot more sense in this current market to discount existing products than make something new because by having even just a product on store shelves to sell, that's better than what their competitor is able to do and it would have saved them all the time and effort of backboarding. Yeah, I think I'm following. At the same time though, I feel like the opposite's true. I feel like if anything, the 11th gen series was, I won't use saved, that's definitely not the right word to use, but it was helped by the global pandemic because in my opinion, AMD could come in right now and, I mean, the 11th gen is a big old flop anyway, but if they really wanted to destroy it, 
um, if that's necessary. They absolutely could with one to two CPUs in the Zen 3 lineup. Mm. So imagine if yeah, AMD fair. came yeah. out right now and they're like, hey guys, we have a 200 to $220 US, doesn't really matter, pick one of those that you think is more likely, Ryzen 5 5600, so a non-X, which would replace the Ryzen 5 3600. Release that CPU, you've already wiped out most of the 11th gen CPUs above it, and then you release a Ryzen uh, 7 5700X 5, or 5700 or 5800X, whatever the non-X equivalent of the 5800X would be, and put that in at around $300, and that just writes off. It, it'd do, it, it'd be like a Cascade Lake X, basically, versus Threadripper all over again. It just wipes, yep. that one part would just wipe out everything above it. So two CPUs, and they could eliminate every single 11th gen CPU that exists right now. Like, absolutely wipe the floor with it. And if, so, if it was a situation where 7 nanometer supply was abundant or the demand wasn't where it was, I think you'd need the supply to be better, really. Uh, so if, if AMD was in a position where they could, you know, they or they were in the position where they needed to make those non-X parts that were more affordable, that'd be a brutal situation for the 11th gen. Like, I don't know... I don't know what you do. Like imagine having those two CPUs in the graphs at those prices. Yeah, and in, that, in that situation, that would, it would probably be beneficial for Intel to have, again, just kept with 10th gen. Because if, if all those CPUs were released, then it would mm -hmm. be cheaper and more effective for them to yeah, price down whatever they're currently offering and make them as affordable as they possibly can. Um, so and I, I, I guess, just to jump in, sorry, ignoring that we've we believe we understand why they've launched the 11th gen. Ignoring that, they were almost presented with a situation where Intel could do the rare thing of looking like the good guys, in my opinion, yep. if they had have done what you're suggesting. Imagine if Intel had have said, you know, it's difficult to buy our competition's CPUs at the moment. Uh, building a PC is just difficult and expensive at the moment, but we have really good supply uh, of our CPUs and they can make their various justifications for why that may be. And because of that, you know, we're going to do an official price cut. So the 10th gen, it's a year on. We're cutting it to this price now. You know, we'll be replacing them later in the year or early next year, whatever the situation may be. I mean, they don't even need to talk about that. But the 10th gen price cuts that you're currently seeing right now, they're official. So in a way, everyone would be re-reviewing the 10th gen stuff because at those prices, they're super competitive. And honestly, they would be my recommendation. Like, yeah, and it really feels like Intel didn't capitalize on the on the price cut situation. Like, it's really been up to reviewers and the tech mm. media in general to talk about Intel's processes rather than Intel getting on the front foot about the pricing that they currently have. Because all the talk, Intel has been almost exclusively focused on 11th gen for a while because we got our first teasers of 11th gen right around when Zen 3 was launching because it seemed like Intel was in a bit of panic stations there and they wanted to remind people that they had an upcoming architecture even though it was like six months later that they actually released those parts. Whereas if around that time, instead of teasing 11th gen and talking about you know the 11900K months in advance, if they'd gone all out and be like, hey guys, our Zen 3 competitor for now are cheaper 10th gen processors. Here's the new prices. Here's the stack. Please talk about this. I think that would have gotten a lot more traction than we would have seen from the 11th gen situation because you know, even from just talking about our content, it's kind of been like people are talking about products like the 10400F and now 11400F as value options, but I wouldn't say there's been a ton of coverage over it. It's been like mm -hmm. you know a, a best CPU update video or something like that, maybe a couple of budget builds I've seen from time to time that have used Intel instead of what previously would have been AMD. But there hasn't been like a, like re-reviews as an example or mm -hmm. really changing the... Like people weren't even talking about in the Zen 3 content. That was more just, well, we'll use the old prices because I don't think the discounts have come in quite as substantial at that point yet. So No, they hadn't. Yeah, it was a, a yeah. really big missed opportunity. But then again, it comes back to, well, you know, Intel executives have historically over the years not really been keen on things like price cuts and you know they want to keep up average sale prices they want to keep their investors mm -hmm. happy by not discounting products um because mm -hmm. that could lead to share price volatility so yeah that's absolutely the situation but i still think taking the opportunity to drive up actual volume of sales and get more people because at the moment, they're hemorrhaging. People are, are jumping over to AM4 and have been for you yep. know, years now, at least in, in, in good numbers since Zen 3 arrived. 
And they could limit that by offering these CPUs and getting people on, you know, Z490 and, you know, they could have even done Z590 if they wanted to. But, you know, looking at prices at places like Newegg, you see the 10700K, $320 US. Like that's almost the same price as the 5600X. Yeah, it's a great so price. That's a great price, great processor for that money. I highly recommend it. I would not recommend AMD over that uh, CPU at that price. So that's definitely one way they, they could have gone about it. Again, we've explained why they didn't, but in our opinion, especially for our audience, that would have been the way to go about it, I think. Yeah, and it just keeps pointing back to there's just so many angles here where Intel has... Mm -hmm. There's no other way to put it apart from botch the launch. I mean, they kind of botched the technology, the, the backport. I can't imagine... And this won't be news to Intel's engineers. You know, The engineering teams of these companies, they're very smart people. They would have known that this part has some technical issues that prevent it from really accelerating performance. So from a from a performance perspective, it's not great. It costs more to make. That's not a great situation. Parts like the Core i9 are more expensive. The 10th gen parts were already good value and the price cuts certainly made them in a really competitive position. So there's, and again, a lot of the messaging around the 11th gen has not been particularly amazing in terms of selling these parts. But again, they could have, you know, seeded 11400F processors and all that sort of thing. So, they, yeah, there's just a lot of missteps and constant missteps one after the other that have really, yeah, kind of just botched the launch. And I think if they had their time over again, they would have, right from the start, done things differently, like not tease the processors so far in advance. Maybe mm -hmm. think more about pricing. Maybe see different parts to reviewers and kind of, hide the 11 900 k's apart because it's just not that good or reduce prices yeah i think yeah the feedback is probably potentially more negative than they're expecting so i think that yeah they probably have a few regrets there big time mm. and also the 10th gen parts have seen these huge price cuts because intel wants to get rid of them yep. so this this is what i've been hearing so no official information here but i've been hearing and there's certainly evidence that has supported that the 10th gen parts have not been selling well over the last year. And there's certainly publicly available things online that you can view, such as, say, the Amazon uh, top CPU sale list. But you know, there's plenty of indicators that that information is accurate. The 10th gen hasn't sold that well. Zen 3 has got people who buy CPUs you know, more interested in, in buying AMD. So these discounts are to clear out that inventory to make way for 11th gen so we could be looking at a situation very shortly i know a lot of the sales are in the us uh, ending today so these 11th gen cpus that that could be the intel if you want to buy an intel cpu you're faced with an 11th gen cpu at these high prices and that makes the so, situation of intel cpus even worse because it does right now the only thing that's keeping them being recommended for now are the cheaper 10th gen parts and then potentially they might have one good 11th gen processor which could be the 11400f depending on mm -hmm. how those reviews play out so yeah yeah that's so i i so as i say i have heard that there isn't really resupply of these 10th gen parts like they're getting rid of them and that that's it so don't expect to see like a 320 dollars 10 700k on shelves for months to come it's they're getting rid of it. Yeah, and I think something that was we were talking about just before we started making this video that was really embarrassing for Intel is the fact that on the Amazon top CPU sales list right now, for example, the Ryzen 5 5600X in, at an inflated price, so above its $300 MSRP, is currently outselling all of Intel's processors. So it's like, well, not all combined, but you know, it's it's in a higher placement on the CPU sales list. So that Could is be not all combined. Great, it's not a great value product right now. And we've had mm. discounted 10400Fs. We've had discounted 10700Ks. We've got new processors just released, which tends to be the most popular time for people to buy those parts. And even then, even faced with AMD's part being terrible value, they're still not able to get their CPUs into a higher sales position. And this is a couple That's of days right. after yeah. launch now. Whereas usually when you see Ryzen come up, like, you know, 5600X is straight to the top of the charts. 5900X, 5950X are all right at the top there. That's a really embarrassing situation for Intel. And I would hate to read reports of what their sales turn out like for these processes over the next month or two. Because, again, even just seeing our video views, and obviously for our 10, 11900K review, again, we get these names wrong all the time because they're so annoying. You know, the 10600K review didn't, for 
a processor that's reasonable, like not the worst product. Mm. Views were not good, good on that on that review. Certainly below um, expectation. There's just not the interest there from buyers. That's right. To give some some stats. So when we reviewed the 10600K, we got just shy of 100,000 views in the first 24 hours. And since then, the channel has grown in sub count by 40%. And we ended up getting 40% fewer views in the first 24 hours on the 11600K review. So mm. some of that will be about the current state of the industry. But it's just people have seen what the 11th gen has to offer. You know, there's been leaked reviews. And yeah, I, I thought there'd be a bit a bit more interest in the 11600K. But nope, there hasn't been. And I did a bit of... Uh, ringing around a few emails <laughs> last night and this morning, uh, speaking with you know distributors and retailers. And the word is that the demand for these 11th gen CPUs is abysmal, like very, very bad. The lowest they've seen for Intel parts in forever, basically. Uh, and again, you hop over to Amazon's best seller list. So you've got to keep in mind, these CPUs just released. They've just got shipments of them. The Amazon best seller is updated every hour. So typically when a new product comes in, a new GPU or a new graphics card, it goes straight to the number one spot or very close to. Usually number one because there's, you know, they get a large volume of them in, heap of excitement, heap of demand, and they just sell them instantly and it goes straight to number one spot. We've got these 11th gen CPUs in. And the right now, if you, at what time is it? It's the afternoon, 2 p.m. on the day this video is going to go out. And the 11700K is the number one best 11th gen CPU. And it's in number, it's 10th, in, in uh, the 10th position. The 11600K, which is the CPU we were just talking about that we reviewed and there wasn't much interest, that's the 19th best seller. So... Pretty crazy stuff, like AMD's Ryzen 5 3400G is in 16th position. But yeah, the number, as I think, as Tim just said, the Ryzen 5 3600 is number one, 3700X number two, 3600X number three, 5600X number four. And you've even got like a $500 3900X in sixth position, well ahead of any of the 11th gen parts. So it's crazy. And for a long time, you never saw an AMD processor in the Amazon top. 10 CPU sale list that just wasn't there. They were always down in like 15th or 16th position. So times have changed. And yeah, Intel definitely needs to turn things around with the next generation or two. Yeah, it feels like the the limits of 14 nanometer, of, you know, people have been talking about this for a long time. You know, 14 mm. nanometer is cooked, it's over, like this is it, this is all they've got. And you know, to be fair to Intel, they've kept reasonably competitive in terms of performance and even pricing for a number of generations now, especially, you know, it's only just recently in the last six months where they haven't been the dominant gaming processor option in terms of performance. Mm -hmm. So 14 nanometers lasted quite a while now, but the foundry struggles from Intel are really going to start kicking in from here because oh, if yeah. they, if 10 nanometer isn't living up to the expectations um, on a processor like Alder Lake, which again, it has a, a fair bit of buzz around it. There's a lot of positivity around what they could be doing with that processor line. But, you know, if it's not up to scratch because of reasons like 10 nanometer struggles or something like that, then they're going to be in a bit of strife because they've run, they've got the absolute most they could have got out of their current foundry process with these current CPUs, and it's just ticked over to being not good enough, not competitive mm -hmm. enough. So, if these struggles continue and, you know, the delays in producing 10 nanometer and keeping on 14 nanometer aren't going to bear fruit within the next year or so, then, yeah, they're going to be in a bit of in a bit of strife, like I said. So, yeah, it, I think the lead up to Alder Lake will be particularly interesting because we did see a lot of interest around Rocket Lake in the lead up. And then over time, as people, as it got closer and closer to launch, expectations became lower and lower. It started off with Rocket Lake sounding like it was going to produce, you know, we're going to get really good frequencies, we're going to have a big IPC improvement, that's going to help Intel retake the crown in gaming, for example. And then, you know, it gets closer and closer to release and the performance expectations dropped over time to eventually mm -hmm. when the reviews come out that it ends up being, you know, in some cases slower, in some cases only slightly faster than previous generation parts. So with the claims that we're currently seeing for Alder Lake, 
is the same thing going to happen with that sort of processor? I mean, again, it's really hard to say, but I don't think that there's going to be as much trust from the community in those sort mm-hmm. of claims um, just based on what we've seen over the last six months to a year. Yeah, it's 100% right. It's going, again, the tables have turned. Like, it was, we were always talking about AMD in a similar vein, like, you know, oh, they're promising this or that, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. And now mm. they're starting to, in some ways, over deliver with what we're expecting to see. Like, Zen 3 certainly uh, met and exceeded my expectations. And as you were talking about, that's really when things, when uh, Intel found themselves in hot water as soon as Zen 3 yeah. launched. Because, in, uh, AMD's now in a position, which I was talking about a moment ago with the non-X parts, where they really could offer the absolute best performance, productivity, and gaming CPUs, as well as the best value by country mile. So that's not a good situation for Intel. Yeah, exactly. So I think, you know, again, the tables have turned in the sense that AMD has been able to execute and then execute again and then execute again and again. And you know, you build trust by executing and improving performance and making your products better each generation. People start to more trust the claims that you're making. And I think that's allowed AMD in a way to price the processes as high as they have because they've slowly built up that trust in the DIY market that people are more willing to pay high prices because they know that the parts are going to be good. Whereas Intel, when they're sort of struggling to execute each year, I think there's going to be some there's some struggles from consumers to believe claims that they might be making about next generation parts, and it'll be up to them to, again, basically do an AMD and prove that they can execute with a next generation processor. And I would expect that, you know, Old Lake, you know, we might see not that great of a lead up to that launch in terms of people being a bit tepid on it, and it might take a while after reviews if it's a good part for people to, again, you know, the mindset has to shift for from one brand to another brand. That always takes time. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff to play out there. And, you know, the claims look reasonable for Older Lake at the moment. We don't know how accurate they are because they're just rumors and leaks at this point. But there's still a lot to play out in terms of the launch. And I certainly wouldn't be calling it right now like the, the obvious savior of Intel's lineup. I think they still have to prove that they can execute with the next generation part before yeah, they regain the trust of this sort of DIY market. And the design is interesting enough that it's not totally clear where the strengths of that sort of hybrid design are going to lie. So, yeah, it's an interesting time. Yeah, there's there's also, yeah, there's the price to performance aspect, but then there's so much more to it that will determine whether it's a success or not, at least in our eyes, because, you know, they're moving to a new socket. We suspect it's, you know, LJ1700. We suspect that, Zen 4 will be on something like AM5. So we're, they're both starting on a new socket, new platform. So what's the direction there? Like, is Intel going to be like, yep, LJ1700, we got Elder Lake, and then the next release, and then we'll start over again, as we've done for, you know, over a decade now. Will AMD do what they did with AM4? Um, obviously, it was a bit sketchy there at times, but are they going to sort of promise three generations on that socket? And if they go out straight out of the gate and say, you know, we're going to do three generations on AM5, you know, people say, oh, I don't upgrade my CPU every gener- generation, but we've seen like every third generation, it, it is often worth that upgrade or it just gives you many more options anyway, especially if you invest in a good quality motherboard off the bat. So, you know, for high end shoppers that are always buying the latest and greatest, probably not too much of a concern, but for like, you know, the mid range, your 11400F sort of viewers that we've been talking about, then those things are. That can save you a lot of money down the track and just a lot of time and headaches as well. So there's more to play out, basically. Yeah, so I think it's probably a good place to to wrap up this discussion because I think we've been going for a fair while at this point, sort of talking about Mm -hmm. most of the things that we wanted to talk about with this launch. And yeah, I think it's been... It's been an interesting launch, but not for the reasons that I was necessarily expecting. I was certainly expecting performance to be better than where it is right now, which would have opened up more of the value discussion because if it was you know faster and stock issues and cheaper then we would have had a lot more to talk about but it really a lot of the discussion has been around intel not really delivering on the launch and kind of botching a few things here and there and you know the the fact that we're talking about a next generation processor from intel right as they're launching (laughs) the the next generation is definitely problematic and i think there's been a lot of reviews talking about next gen stuff already so yeah, that's, that's probably 
probably the place to leave it unless you had any sort of final thoughts on 11th gen for now no not really i mean we've yeah i think we've said it all um we've got our first two reviews out we'll skip the 11 700k a few people have been asking if we're going to review that i don't see the point it's basically the 11 100k review but about a you know better price but still not competitive in my opinion so it really will yeah the next interesting review will be the 11 400f which hopefully we can have on the channel next week i think that will be positive i'll be testing it with a b560 motherboard nice. not a b550 yeah. board uh and yeah so anyway that that's that's pretty much it on my end that's all i've got to say yeah so stay tuned for that review i think the core i3 line this time around i'm not sure if you you test it because mm. it's just a refresh of previous comet lake parts isn't it um, well in terms again, of again, high frequency that sort of thing yeah have we got pricing information i didn't think um we... not sure we'd have to check on that yeah i'd, I'd have to check but again uh, it depends on what the price is because as we've been talking about refreshes are okay if you're getting like you know something at a much better price so we'll, yeah. we'll work that one out down the track yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll deal with the 11 400 f first so yeah yeah I thanks for watching pre yeah pretty much does it as you say yep thanks for watching yep. we've got our patreon so, and discord communities if you're interested in signing up and float plane all that sort of thing it's been interesting to chat with some of the people in the discord community over the 11th gen release a lot mm. of different opinions in there some yeah disappointment i think people are having a bit of fun with how bad intel is but that's currently the state of things and how it is so you kind of expect that um mm. what else is there we've got behind the scenes videos monthly live stream will be coming up at some point in this month because i think this will be going out in april so well it's april now in australia so it definitely will be yeah. um and yeah well so there to say like the video if you enjoyed it. i think this is probably going to be like an hour long so good job if you've made it to the end 20 percent club nice nice work there and yeah we'll get back to some benchmarking cool well i'm your host monitor steve i'm your host tim we'll see you, see you in the next one